We're on round two. Had a, a really good discussion um, with Adam and Nick, mostly on the fundamental side. I think it was was a large element of that. Um, uh, Adam got into some some optionality, which I think was a, an interesting concept. And um, Nick talked uh, more about the sort of macro side and how his funds dealing with the situation. We've got two new guests now. Um, we've got Rolf and Blake. Now Rolf um, has been around the sort of education circuit for for a number of years now. Uh, you should definitely check out his his website, tradercity.com. I think it's the the one, but you obviously can see his handle right there. Um, and Blake Morrow, well. You know, he looks very youthful, but he's been in the market for even longer than I have. Um, and he sort of traded everything as well. And I'll talk a little bit about what they do in a second. But, you know, Rolf comes from a from a pure technical basis. He, he, he you know, probably can't talk too much around what's going on the fundamentals. He looks at price action. He looks at technical analysis. He does it very well. Uh, as I say, if you go to his website, you can see some really good education around there. Uh, he runs a, a fantastic trading journal called Edgewonk, which I'll let him talk to you, talk to you in a second. And for, for me as a trader, and a strategist as well is like the idea of continuous improvement the idea of about um understanding what you're doing right what you're doing wrong do more of what's right less of what's what's not working you know is, is so underrated amongst the retail traders so that's something that, that, that you should speak to uh blake morrow uh, works with a group of very talented guys at forex analytics um you know they do a whole range of of, of different uh, factors around mainly around currency markets but i think they, they talk about other, other aspects as well Really, really good color. He's been around the block. You know, there's 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 few people out in the and the sort of the social spheres who who've got as as much in, uh, as much understanding about markets as as, as Blake. So, yeah, to, to welcome to the webinar, guys. I I just sort of touch base on. Um, let me just read out the disclaimer just to go back um, to see just to say that anything that we say right now is is going to be uh, general in nature. Um, please don't take this as uh, personal advice in any shape or form. Uh, these are the, the thoughts of. You know, myself and the guests and should not be taken as, as personal advice but um i'll start with you uh blake do you want to just tell us a little bit about what you do at forex analytics and 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 you know the process that you you guys go around doing uh sure and uh thanks first of all thanks for having uh thanks for having me and i appreciate that you think i look youthful <laughs> <laughs> considering i'm almost, I'm, I'm, a couple, I'm a couple years shy of 50 so i, I appreciate that um uh uh, but at Forex Analytics, uh, originally, for, for many years prior to Forex Analytics, I had um, been the chief uh, currency strategist for MB Trading, which eventually got bought by Ally Financial. And so um, when we were making that transition to be purchased uh, by Ally Financial, um, the, I had spoken with the owners there, and I said, look, I'm, I, I don't want to be this little little cog inside this huge machine. I, I really like to go do something on my own. And I knew Ally Financial didn't really care about the FX market a whole lot. They really more or less wanted um, the clients for the, the equity side. And at that point, uh, I, I went, and this is nearly five years ago, um, concurrently they allowed me to build out Forex Analytics, uh, the platform. So I had a, I had a place for Traders that I've been communicating with and dealing with for the last 15 previous years, um, or you know, 14, 15 years, they, they could have a place to go and, and, and a safe place to go. And so that's how I started building Forex Analytics. And at the same time, uh, I started also uh, trading for a small um, fund, uh, private fund, if you will. And so I kind of do both. Well, I do definitely, I do both concurrently. But uh, I, I've got a great team of um, people that work at Forex Analytics that, um, you know, we, aside from myself, that provide analysis. We, we provide different types of analysis for traders, uh, which is, is good. It's kind of like having, um, you know, confirmation when you're trading, when you're using, uh, uh, maybe some of you might trade via correlations and you're like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to only go along the euro dollar if, uh, you know, the cable is moving higher against the dollar as well. And looking for that, you know, confirmation with that, and maybe gold. Well, in forex analytics, we might use multiple types of analysis, whether it's, uh, you know, macro analysis, or, or or you're looking for a candlestick formation to set up that day, or perhaps, um, you know, uh, uh, some sort of Elliott wave um, pattern is setting up, and you want that to coincide with 
with what you're doing in uh, some sort of basic technical analysis methodology. Well, methodology, excuse me. And we, um, uh, that's what we do at Forex Analytics. We kind of put it all together. Plus, we have a chat room, uh, a chat room that people I've been chatting with for 10, 5, 15 years are in that chat room and um, amongst the rest of our team. And so, and then plus we put everything on a mobile device too. So if you if you you're not in front of your desktop like I'm, I'm sitting in front of my computer that I'm at, you know, 12 hours a day, you you, you might be mobile. Well, you can have all that analysis um, on your mobile device, which is good because, as you guys all know, and most of the traders out there know, uh, you know, being in a 24 hour market, uh, well, now I'm. I, it seems like I'm at home 24 hours a day now, <laughs> but pre pandemic. You know, it, we live our life outside and away from our, our home offices and, um, you know, whether it's uh, you know, grocery shopping or you're at kids, for me, it would be a kid's uh, sporting event, um, you know, the markets are still moving. So being able to have that analysis on your on your, on your mobile device, because I, I know for me, it's just not as easy being able to read charts. Um, on my trading platform, because I use like JP Morgan and their charts are the worst charts that I've ever seen in my life. But when you're using, when you're, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to analyze something, it's not so easy, right? But when you have analysis where you can zoom in on the chart, understand what, what somebody is saying, that's what we do. And um, we found it to be very um, useful for, for, for our, our traders. I just want to say as well. I just want to say as well that it's uh, five o'clock in the morning where Blake is, so he's um, he's making a Herculean effort to uh, to be with us today. So obviously, thank you for that. And yeah, you do look pretty good for uh, for five o'clock in the morning. Thank Rolf, you. Uh, Rolf's uh, out in Frankfurt, um, so it's a, a, a somewhat better hour of the day. But why don't you uh, why don't you give us a bit of background about your trading and and what you guys do there at Trader City? Sure. Uh, and again, thanks for having me. It's uh... I'm really happy to be part of this. And I got first introduced into the stock market when I was um, 16. That was just at a dot-com boom. Everybody, even in Germany, was into stocks. So my family was into stocks. And I had my first introduction. Back then, there was no computer. I was watching the, the stock ticker on the TV, the teletext. And ever since then, I was really fascinated by the idea that you can just be at home or wherever, and you not have to go to a job, to a real job and uh, potentially make money off of something where you don't have to work as hard physically. So I, w I kept this always in my mind. I had my first stock portfolio back then. And then w when I was in university, I went to the traditional economics. I was really fascinated by fundamental data. Uh, I have a very, very heavy background um, in uh, financial analysis, corporate finance, uh, what economics uh, in university and then after university um, I was already trading for five or six years actively and uh, of course and when you get out of high school um, sustaining or um, providing for yourself just with trading um, after just being in university obviously you don't have as many savings so I went to Asia I pretty much moved to Asia um, to cut down living expenses living costs and just free up a whole bunch of my time to focus on my trading exclusively and yeah i just came back to germany like two two and a half years ago uh, once all those um, travel restrictions are over i'm actually moving back to thailand but um, yeah i've been doing trade society now for six years i think uh, with my partner moritz um, he's by the way also a huge fan of forex analytics and um, yeah we have been doing trade society for six years he's an independent trader who comes from professional poker um, and now we are just in the process of setting up our fund overseas um, in also in Asia that's why we are moving both back and yeah on trade society we do um, regular trading education I we trade both the same um, very similar time frames and trading styles it's mostly price action I used to be on the higher time frames he used to be on the five minute to one minute because of his poker background he always said he needed the action um, so he went to the lower time frames we are completely and um, only price action uh, momentum analysis based um, and yeah that's what we've been doing on, on edge Wonk, obviously we have our trading journal which is used by retail traders but even fund traders and hedge fund and prop firms and all around the world yeah and that's what we've been doing for 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 a few years now 
Mm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Blake, I'll, I'll just touch on um, one of the things we talked about with the, with the last guest, and I think it's really important, is, is as a trader, you need a positive expectancy uh, through your framework, through your trading process. Um, talk to me just about your process and, and how you sort of set up the trade, how you, how you, you enter a trade, you know, what gives you the, the you know, the, the, the entry points, you know, what you look for when you're in a trade, how you manage the your risks and, and, and ultimately, you know, how you close the trade and how you how you improve the trade. So what gives you your edge in, in your trading process? Well, that's, uh, that's a loaded question. So, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big, I, I've, got a, I've got a pretty long answer to that. Um, right, okay. But but really uh, what I'm looking for is, is I'm, I'm constantly like, like many of you, I, I'm stalking something and I spend um, the majority of my day really looking for what I what I consider to be the best setup. Um, and and you know I, and I think one of the guys that I know out of uh, out of New York, uh, one of the guys that I, I trade with, he said he said it best. He's like I, I spend I spend the majority of my month um, you know kind of fiddling around, you know, just trading trading in and out of things. But really it's 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 looking for that one or two setups a month that are gonna that, that make my month, and and that's what I'm I'm basically doing. I, I spend most of my time just kind of probing the market a little bit, looking for you know maybe you know a, a little bit of an edge, whether it's uh, it's price action like what Wolf is saying. Is I, I do look a lot a lot of price action in a, a different markets, whether it's a, a divergence in, in, in the way a market the way a currency is acting versus maybe a precious metal or or, or an indice. Or you know, like uh, for example, like stocks continue to go higher, but the Aussie is stalling at this time. So I might be looking for you know if the stock market reverts back to the mean a little bit, the Aussie might be a good short, something like that, right? And I might spend weeks really just just waiting for uh, a certain level to break um, because it may have tested it so many times that I know that when it does break. It's probably going to be a severe break, whether it's a breakout or a breakdown. And then from there, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly managing whatever my risk reward is going to be. Because for me, I always try to I tr always try to achieve, you know, some sort of higher risk versus reward, like multiples higher. Because I know as a trader, I'm going in with fairly large size. So I'm going to be the first thing I'm going to do is once I'm profitable, I'm taking some off the table. I'm trying to move my stops to break even, and then I'm trying to manage a core position to, to, to make the rest of whatever I was looking for. So, therefore, I have to look at some multiple. Like I'm risking one to make four or five. You know, like let's say I'm risking ten grand to make fifty grand, something like that. But I'm yeah. not. I know I'm not going to make fifty grand. You know what I mean? Sorry, go on, mate. Finish off. Oh, I was going to say, I know I'm not going to make that that large of amount on that one trade because I might be looking for, you know, to taking pieces off and then managing a core position from there. So I'm always trying to extend a really big risk versus reward or big reward versus risk at, at any moment in time, especially if I'm going to step in the market pretty with size. So. Yeah. Well, I just I just wanted to go back and um, and I'll get uh, Rolf's um, process in a second. But he he talked about a market that was just continually banging on the ceiling and 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 put on this. This is one that you know I talked about in the last uh, last webinar. But this is WTI uh, XTI to USD, and yeah, this is one that just continues to bang. So I mean, how would you how would you play this one right now if you've if you've seen that we've made you know, multiple cracks at this uh, uh, basically the March gap we've we filled filled the gap and we're just trying to play it out I and mean, how, how would you how would your approach be to this setup now that that's getting quite a bit of attention well the, you know for, for me it, it's 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 either or you know I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna play it on the long side on a breakout or I'm gonna play it on the short side if it starts to roll over but I'll, but if it starts to roll over I have to see certain things happen and, and I'm a lot probably like Wolf in a, in, a, in the sense that I do trade technicals, and um, technicals to me kind of overrule everything else. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't take into consider in, into consideration everything else. Um, I will start looking for you know a, a, a simplicity 
or uh, simply put, maybe lower lows, lower highs, in order for me to, uh, you know, for something like this in, the, in this instance, would be suggesting that we might be rolling over. I might be looking at relative strength or maybe some short-term oscillators to kind of confirm those ideas. Um, but the, yeah, that 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 would. I and you're, you're, tra you're, tra you're trading off daily charts or four-hour charts, I think you said. Yeah, I, I do trade off daily charts, but I do I have to I have to narrow things down into hourly charts because for me it's you know it's it's uh, usually some sort of macro idea the the reason I'm buying or selling something, but then I I'm entering on more of a macro or a, a micro type of uh, technical chart, whether it's an hourly or a four-hour chart. So. Mm. And talk to me, Rolf, um, about, I mean, you talked a little bit about your, your, your time frames and your, and your strategies with your partner, uh, Moritz. Um, but talk to me about, you know, what is it that gives you your edge, the, 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 the positive expectancy and, and, and the real, you know, the process that you try and follow uh, to try and be consistent and try and be profitable and grow the capital in your trading account? Right. So I come from a very statistic based <clears throat> background. I majored in statistics. So I have a huge focus on reward to risk ratio, as you also stressed, I think. Um, reward to risk ratio in combination with your win rate, that's the that's the most important part of your trading system. So I focus on trying to keep my reward to risk ratio not super high, but I have a cutoff point, uh, which I won't trade below. So there's a like I won't trade below a two to one. Um, that had the chart has to offer that. And um, if it doesn't provide the at least uh, I'm not interested in trading it. And my general approach is that I use the daily time frame as a to get my bias, whether it is a are we in a is it a long market, is it a short, is it with the trend or is it a pullback trade? And then I will go down um, depending on the time frame, um, anywhere between the 15 and the, the four hour really to find um, the right entries based on structures, price action, breakouts. Um, those are the things that I typically look for. Okay, well, one, one question, because I, I, I'm a big fan of um, knowing your risk to reward. And, and for me, I, when, I, when I look at my, how much risk <laughs> I'm taking on in a position, that's driven by the volatility. Uh, I tend to look at implied volatility, but a lot of people use average true range or you know some sort of uh, statistical volatility measurement to understand um, you know the degree by which price is moved you can work out how much risk you can potentially take on um, within your time frame um, but in terms of the ability to hit your 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 target you know your intended target you don't necessarily have to hit a, um, a price target firmly you can let the trade right if it so goes but if, if you are working on a statistical background that you know you need to get you on a two to one because you will it means you can get 40 percent or so of your trades right um what do you do to block out the emotion uh i know you're looking purely at price but you know you still must get yeah you know, all the news that's coming through and, and everything that's going on yeah you know, how do you block out this idea about everything that all the noise and everything that's going on so that you do give yourself a greater chance to get to your, your reward. Right. Yeah, so first of all, during the day, I try to block out as much external noise. So I'm not on social media. There's no phone around me in my trading office. I don't uh, have a TV. So those are, that's a, as a starter. Uh, and then when it comes to execution, um, this is the idea I got from, the, from Marty Schwartz's book, Pitbull Champion Trader, uh, with a checklist. Um, so in the beginning, I used to have a physical checklist. Now I incorporate it into my, my actual journal. That helps with entries at least, a little bit with entry um, screening or timing as well. So that is another layer of removing some of the subjectivity, uh, potential for errors. And then once I'm in a trade, um, I mostly apply a very passive approach to, to trade management. Um, so I usually let the trade ride uh, either until it hits the stop or the target. Um, unless there are some uh, specific technical signals that completely go against the trade. And when it comes to finding the right reward to risk ratio, I just look, I use a few um, moving averages, and those are usually the only things that I look for for potential um, for the potential profit um, that the trade may offer. So if I get into a short, but I see right away there's a big moving average um, in my way, uh, and it's not even at a one-to-one -one reward to risk ratio cutoff point, then this is where I will just skip the trade, even though it's a perfect setup, for example. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll, we'll touch on on some of the entry points in a minute. If you can bring up some of your charts, we'll um, we'll go through some currency pairs in a moment. Um, but Blake, I wanted to touch on you because this is something that's really interesting, especially for me out here in Australia. You know, uh, what we often see is is the Asian trading session being, you know, somewhat reflective. Everyone sort of after a big move in U.S. trade, big move in European trade, we tend to sort of sit on our hands, regress, think about the world and how the big moves happened. Um, and, you know, Asia can be sometimes flatline, dull, getting prepared for the next session ahead. Um, so, you know, how important is it for, for, for traders to identify their trading strategy with the sort of expected ranges that you see in, in a certain time? How, how does that change your, you know, what does time frame or, or time zone and the sort of movement you see um, dictate someone's trading philosophy? For example, if I have a look at this chart here, you can see the, the the sort of ranges that you see in this is the New York session, the orange, uh, the, the green one, the the pink one is there is London, and then you've got Asia. So you can see the sort of expected moves in cable uh, are, are quite small, um, and then you do see these kind of big moves in cable in, in in green. So if you want movement, you generally go into the sort of U.S. trading session. If you're trading in Asia, that means staying up overnight, doesn't it? So how does that affect? You know, how, how does trading like that affect, you know, what you're doing and, and what, what lessons the retail should, should take out of that? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, kind of like you, um, uh, in, in being in the, where you're at in the world and in Australia and dealing with the Asian, Asian session, uh, I, I would think that that's probably one of the more difficult areas to, 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 to be in. Although, what I always notice in the Asian session is, because I'm, I'm in it as well, it's in the evening for me, uh, where I live, uh, it's, it, you know, it's typically fading. It, it's fading whatever move has just happened in, in, in the North American session. Asian traders tend to, tend to fade it. Not all the time, but they tend to. Anyway, um, it, it really, for me, it impacted me more when I, when I moved um, to where I live now to be around my family. You know, technology kind of gave us this opportunity to kind of pick up our things and go wherever we want. And um, uh, there's there's only two guys that I know in FX uh, where I live is one of them is me. And the other one is Greg Michalowski, which is from Forex Live. He, he actually lives, uh, he lives about a mile away from me and we get together for some drinks from time to time. He's a great guy. Uh, I love him to death. And I run into him in the grocery store every once in a while too. It's just interesting. Anyway, um, we, we have kind of a unique um, set of rules around here just because of where we live. But because of that, I, I tend to get up early in the mornings to, to, to be able to capture that, that crossover between the European and North American time. Because what happens, what I notice that happens more times than not is that there might be a, a, a move that's, you know, maybe outside of a standard deviation move that I know is going to revert back to the mean a little bit as North American traders are coming in. Because when I get up at three o'clock in the morning, it's six o'clock in the morning in New York. And I know all the traders in New York are getting in front of their computers that whether, you know, obviously not right now, they, they weren't, you know, on, on the train or anything going into the, the city. Now people are getting up in front of their computers. Their behavior is, I, I've got my Bloomberg, like for me, I light up my Bloomberg at like, you know, three o'clock in the morning. They're doing that at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And everybody in Europe already knows that North American traders are coming online. So whatever profits that they're in, they're going to be taking them off the table as soon as I get up. And so that's why when I wake in the morning, I already know that, you know, if I happen to be in a position overnight, uh, like let's say I'm, you know, I'm long euro dollars overnight, and I happen to, you know, be up 30 or 40 pips, and I'm just waking up, and I know it's getting close to some sort of resistance that I've been monitoring. I might be taking some off the table there because I know that Europeans are going to do the same thing. They're going to take it off as North American traders come in. So um, I have to use that crossover in trading time, uh, the, 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 and to my benefit and. It, it just takes a lot of a lot of experience and, and, and years of watching the, um, uh, you know uh, you know the different crossover times where you live to understand when the best trading times are. And one thing that you mentioned, uh, Chris, that's really important 
is you you said you, you tend to look at uh, implied volatility. You know, I, I, I look at the euro dollar monthly implied volatility all the time. And these are levels that are very dangerous for traders. Um, you know, we like to see, you know, implied, uh, I, I think I have it on my screen too at some point. Oh yeah, I have it right here. You know, the, the, the euro dollar one month implied volatility, you, you could you could pull it up if you want. It's 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 at six six fifty. You know, when we're when we're around the six fifty or uh, six to seven, that that's a little it's a little dangerous. Yeah, you know, pull up the line chart there. Yeah, there you can see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are these are levels that, you know, for me as a trader, I, I don't like volatility at these levels. I like volatility up towards eight or 10. And then that usually gives us as traders more of a swinging type of volatility. But as you guys have probably seen in the euro dollar, I mean, we're, we're stuck between this, you know, 111.50 to, you know, 114 for now, it's not gonna last forever. This chart will confirm, you know, a breakout or breakdown in, in the euro dollar. Um, but, you know, for me, I'm, I'm typically looking at that one month vol at, you know, eight to nine is, is, is a place where I like to live in. I don't know about you. Well, I mean, but for, I'm, I'm a, I, I love, I think vol is central to my, to my world. Um, uh, you know, when you, when you're discussing risk and, and position sizing, whether mm -hmm. you're looking at realized volatility, um, ATRs, for example, or, you know, envelopes, Bollinger Bands, whatever you're, you're focused on, or, you know, you're looking forward at, at what's implied. Um, yeah, I think it's absolutely, it's, it's not just about, um, yeah, how much risk you're taking on, then you can get a better position size, but it's also, it dictates the strategy, right? I mean, if you've got high volatility, you know, you're going to be probably short emerging market currencies, you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to be short carry structures. And if you, if you get very low vol, um, you know, you're going to go into the high, high yielding currencies like the Mexican peso, the South African rand, the Brazilian real, those kind of currencies and try and pick up the extra carry because that's going to be working quite well in low vol and, and positively trending equity markets. So it dictates your strategy as well. Um, I'll go into Rolf. I mean, Rolf, wh wh how, how much does, um, you know, when you're looking at risk positions or strategies or I, I suppose it's more about the risk for you, but, you know, how much does the, the do volatility measures play into your, you know, how you're dictating your stops, or do they not at all? Right. So yeah, I do use the ATR just to get a general sense if my default stop loss approach um, is okay, or if I need to add some uh, padding, extra padding to the stop loss when the move, uh, market is moving extremely uh, volatile, or when the market isn't um, being as volatile. You you can either especially also use a smaller stop loss. Um, to get also a smaller target in um, to keep the reward to risk ratio constant while not in increasing your holding time too much when the market isn't moving. But I use a I use a trend filter um, when I go through all the pairs that I'm watching um, to to scan out or to filter out the ones that aren't moving and are stuck in small ranges. So that's my first um, filter process. So I only stay with the tr with the the markets that have been ranging in the past. And are now exhausting or that are just starting out to show uh, breakout signs or signs of a new trend emerging. So I, I try to keep my, my watch list um, with the pairs that I follow relatively fresh. I do this every two to three days. Um, so that's what I usually do. I follow like 40 Forex pairs, but mm -hmm. during a given week, there will only be maybe like right now, there are like not even 10 that I will follow for the next week because the other ones just don't have favorable conditions. Yeah, I just want to talk to you both about um, <clears throat> this risk on risk off environment, because it's so central to everything we're doing. I mean, if I look at now the 60 day correlation between the S&P futures, which you can see here as a kind of um, histogram, I suppose. Um, and we're looking at the relationship between S&P futures and, and the dollar index, which is a basket of currencies traded against um, the dollar, 57% um, weighted towards the euro. So when people talk about the dollar, they tend to sort of focus on this, on this one. Um, it's USDX on on MetaTrader. But uh, you can see here, if we do, if we look at the correlation, the rolling correlation between the um, the, the, the US dollar and um, S and P futures by um, by value as opposed to um, percentage, you can see it's pretty much um, tick for tick I, over a longer period. Obviously, shorten the time frame there. So you know, for me at the moment, the correlations in FX markets are really 
very, very high. Um, and they're, you know, right at the epicenter of that is, is what's happening in, in US equities. So, you know, have you got any thoughts about, Blake, have you got any thoughts about, about this big correlation trade and, and how that affects your FX trading? You know, that's, it's, it's funny that you bring up this chart because um, the way I, the way I, just so, you, just so you guys know, or everybody listening in knows, um, I Skype into my office uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut with the, the, the small group of traders that, um, that I trade with, um, which most of them are on social media. They're just, you know, uh, ex, you know, Lehman, Goldman type of traders that, you know, we all, we all trade together, just a small group of us. Um, most people in my community know, know who I'm trading with. Uh, I, I, I Skype in with those guys out of Greenwich. And, and we talk about dynamics of the market all, all day long. That's all, that's all we're doing. Then at the same time, I'm chatting w with my chat room with people from Forex Analyst. And one of the topics of conversation has been pretty heavy the last two weeks is everything that I'm doing in FX, it's all one trade. It's all correlated to the S&P. With that inverse correlation that Chris just showed us, it's dead on. I mean. It's like you, you don't even have to trade S&P futures. You can just trade the, the, the Aussie dollar. You know, you can yeah. trade, you know, basically the, 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 the Kiwi um, instead of just in trade, instead of trading the S&P. So there are outliers, obviously. Uh, the yen is kind of doing its own thing, which is um, really changed things up over the last several months um, from a correlation standpoint. But for, for the dollar, um, block of currencies minus the yen. Yeah, it's just one big correlation, uh, which it's great because then you're just looking for confirmation um, of, a, you know, for the S&P to do something before you as a currency trader do something. But at the same time, it, it makes it a little boring when the only thing that's happening is stocks are going up higher than dollars and bleeding lower, you know? Well, let, let's have a look at the, um... Let's have a look at the S and P at the moment. Um, um, Ralph, uh, Ralph, sorry, if you if you've taken a view now, I mean, if you if you look at the charts, um, I'll put a daily time frame on here. I mean, I'm happy to sort of change this unless you want to take control of the screen yourself. If you've got a chart that you want to look at, but if I'm looking at the daily chart at the moment, you know, do you see this? I mean, if we sort of have a look in here, we've got this the higher higher. Here. It looks like we want to try and break through. Um, let me just bring out get all the bits and pieces on the. So we're looking to push through here through the recent highs. You know, we potentially go in to sort of take out you know, these highs here. I mean, what, what are you seeing in terms of the price action just anecdotally there? Does this feel like, you know, given that the importance of this market there to, to FX pairs and you're looking at the, the S&P, the US sort of institutional benchmark, you know, without understanding the news flow that's going on, you know, when you look at this chart, does it, does it feel like we're in a distribution? Does it feel like we're in choppy sideways trade? Does it feel like it wants to move higher what would you look for from this uh, right now right and i think this is a beautiful chart to really um which illustrates pretty much what has happened in fx um i used to be a, an exclusively like a higher time frame trader but ever since especially after yeah, when corona hit and especially now that it's um slowly easing off at least in in, in europe um i found that the higher time frames are way less reliable or so to speak, they just don't show as much momentum. You will see what you're seeing here since, um, yeah, since mid June, um, the market is pretty much in a sideways range. And that's exactly where I had my, my last trade on the S&P was just around before uh, June the 9th, where you see <clears throat> uh, this is where the price bounced off a previous support level. Yeah, exactly there. You can see this is what I look for on the daily time frame. <clears throat> Um, this is what I call deceleration. You can see the market goes from very bullish candles to smaller bullish candles to then a slow, uh, small bearish candle and it slowly rolls over. This is happening right at a very big um, resist uh, support level, which was established in January 2020. Um, and yeah, this is uh, when you go to the lower time frame. That's where you have a beautiful pattern with a nice breakout. And ever since then, the lower, the higher time frames I find are less trendy um so it's it's really 
the, the screening process has changed for me a bit. And as Blake said, it's everything is very correlated. So this week, for example, pretty much my whole was, watch list is Aussie. Um, um, yeah. Aussie influenced. Most of the pairs that I will be watching for next week are Aussie and Kiwi, um, because those are the ones that have the high, the nicest higher time frame perspective. But right now for the S&P, uh, I'm not too interested to do anything un until the market gets back to 32.50, roughly where we have the last uh, swing high. And above that, there's still the 33.40 level, which I'm still also interested in. Yeah, but right now, as long as the market is pretty much in the middle of a range or not at the extremes of a range, I would not be too interested in trading this. Yeah, Blake, it's interesting because I was looking at um, some some statistics today uh, that if you get the top five companies in the S&P, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, um, Amazon, and you look at how, how much those five companies have progressed this week um, or last week or the week we've just had, yeah. Then you work out the market capitalization of that they've added those five companies added together as an aggregation, and you listed that market cap on the S and P. It would be the tenth largest company. So you know, just just five companies alone, just the gain that they've had, just because of the the, the sheer weighting that these companies now have. I think the top five companies um, on the S and P now have a 25% um, weighting on the index alone, which is the highest for for decades. So when you talk about the market, everyone's focused on breadth at the moment. They're talk, they're focused on the narrowing breadth and you know the, yeah. the, the quality of the journey going from A to B. So yeah, you know, how how do you do you look at it in market internals and and you know you, you're assessing that quality of the journey from A to B with the idea of what's the probability of it therefore getting to C? I do, and and um, and what's you know you, and like you said, there's there's a lot of there's one camp that says um, you know that can't last so we got to start looking on the short side of you know whether it's the financials you know the banking sector or whatever and, and, and just mind you i trade predominantly fx and, and some yeah. precious metals and I, but i it's not like i don't pay attention um but it, it is crazy when you take the netflix or the amazons of the world and, and facebook or, or rather apple and and you look at those companies and what they're doing the problem is is it's everybody is overweight and everybody is long and every um every uh, uh fund and institution is chasing yield right now because they have to show that they are invested in the markets because they have to beat the index there's they have no other choice if they don't beat the indexes they're going to start getting redemption so th th you got everybody piling into just a few names that's scary. It's kind of like that, um, you know, it's, it's like a, a boat and you got everybody on the starboard side and, you know, the boat might tip over soon. Um, yeah. and, and that does really concern me, but that doesn't mean that the, those, the, those few names can't turn the entire tide as well. So it's interesting. I just want to interrupt because, um, yeah, we saw the, um, the weekly CFTC report coming out. Um, and if we look at the, the, the the traders for financial futures report which goes into sort of more depth around what leveraged funds are doing you know these are the ctas the guys who are obviously using leverage for speculative purposes and you and and also the what the institutional guys are doing and i'm taking the nasdaq here because this this market's on fire and we'll come back to fx in a moment but i just think because equities are so important to the effect effect story that i always look at this in a bit more depth but you know everyone's saying um everyone's overweight the market but if you look at the the position for for leverage funds actually they're they're they're, they're net short then they haven't they, you know they're not massively overweight you know short positions have been increasing recently it's the asset managers the institutional asset managers which have been building up a short but the leverage players surprisingly really surprisingly are actually short the market at the moment on a net basis and you know what, what causes this market to go up was it is it just retail is it asset managers yeah the the leverage guys are still underweight nasdaq stocks even though we've had that huge move so maybe there's still some positioning to to come into this market so i think that's a, an interesting um thing i just want to touch base on uh, in that in that regard and i just want to go back to the to one of the main talking points we've got at the moment um and i'll come back to you blake because you know you're there um you know you're feeling it every day of the week and um yeah, the, the, it's the dollar story right so we know that dollar's got a strong correlation with the s p hence why i've been focused on that um 
but on the ground, I mean, what's everyone's what, what's that? What's the feeling um, about the, the the U.S. dollar? Because if you get your dollar call right, you're generally doing pretty well in life, right? right. Um, and what's your what, what are you feeling about the U.S. dollar? So I've got the dollar index here, which is the USDX. We can go into individual currencies as you want, but um, yeah, what's your what's your dollar view at the moment? I, you know, my, my dollar view is, is bearish. I mean, I've, I've been expecting the euro to rally, but next week we got a euro group meeting, which might actually loosen things up a little bit. You know, if, if you get some sort of cohesiveness amongst the, the euro group, which, you know, I, we'll see. I think that's like a, a, one of the dislodging pieces to the puzzle that could happen um, that maybe has held back the dollar from. From, from really selling off. But at the same time, you you know, this is also, as you pointed out, and we've been talking about, this is an equity market story. And at this moment in time, if, and, and, and there are other things that I'm looking at regarding equities, you know, I, I, you know aside from, you know, just watching a few names that are just exploding, um, you know, you, you also have sentiment that's, that's kind of off the charts right now. And, and when, when sentiment is so extreme and a bullish nature, you, you are almost asking for a revert to the mean type of trade to come and smack us in the head here in the next week. Um, so I, if, if the markets correct or even consolidate, I think there's a lot of people that are leaning on the dollar right now. They're selling dollars, they're long Aussies, they're, you know, you know, you can go back and look at positioning and positioning i think only tells part of the story nowadays there's so many different ways to position yourself in the market uh whether it be options it's i, I think cftc uh uh data only tells a portion of the story you know i and, and i don't know about you chris i i know you we both have access to bloomberg i i have um in terms of the, the firm that i trade with i have emails from analysis from so many different, whether it's Goldman, uh, City, City, uh, you know, Citibank, uh, all, all the different major players in the FX market, JP Morgan. So I, I not only look at CFTC data, I'm looking at their their uh, individual positioning indicators based on what their books are showing. So, um, like I said, CFTC doesn't tell me the whole story. But I think a lot of people have been leaning on the dollar, expecting the dollar to kind of collapse uh, with this melt up that we've seen in equities. But if equities pull back at all from current levels, we will see a little bit of a snap back in the dollar. And um, do you mind if I take over the charts really quick? Can I show you something really quick? Well, I'm going to see if I can, uh, can make this work. Sorry. I'll I think just, uh... you have to pass it to me. I don't think I can take it from you. There's a, like a drop down and you can you can hand it over to me. And if not, it's fine. Um, I, I can just kind of, I can Hold walk. On. It's been a while since I, uh, we, oh yeah, there we go. Um, there you go. Now I got to show which monitor. Monitor two, clean. All right, can you see my chart? Yep. yep. Okay, so you can see, uh, yeah, okay, so let me move. This is that um, ball of let me get that out of the way. So, um, you, you know, we were talking about the S&P here, and m many of you guys are familiar with TradingView. We, use, we incorporate TradingView into our, um, you can see in our Forex analytics chart. Uh, we do that as well, just because it's, uh, it's, it's pretty universal for a lot of retail customers. But this is the S&P chart we were talking about, or you were, you just had up, and this is like the downtrend line from um, you know the all-time highs, right? And 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 basically we closed at that downtrend line, you know, and 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 the risk is increasingly daily that we're going to uh, we're we're going to see this rally through you know through these highs through this 127 percent bid level and and really start you know challenging the 3300 level. There's some gaps up here. That a lot of traders keep referencing up, uh, you know, near 33.40 that need to be filled, you know, yada yada yada. But the equity markets look like they're setting up to to make that to make that move higher. Um, and so I'm looking at the Aussie dollar, probably like many of you are, um, you know, as we knock our head up against 70 cents. I really have been expecting the Aussie 
to rip above 70 cents and not just the Aussie, the Kiwi above, you know, 66 cents as we, you know, taken out this multi-year, this is from 2014, by the way. Uh, you know, you look at the Kiwi, we, we're, we're probing really important levels and I've expected the dollar to just kind of collapse here and the, the Kiwi dollar to start ripping higher and the Aussie dollar to start ripping higher. But frankly, it hasn't happened. So that that does concern me a little bit from a correlation standpoint, as we were talking about that inverse correlation, Chris, the, the one to one, if you will, you know, S&P goes up. Why, why isn't the Aussie and why isn't the Kiwi? Why aren't they breaking out? And because they're not breaking out, that is making me a little bit nervous if we see that pullback. Now, what I ultimately want to see here, and this is kind of what I hope, not what I hope, and, 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 and I try to explain this to our traders all the time, what I hope happens in the market isn't what I'm going to get. I'm, I, I try to anticipate things happening in the market, but obviously I'm wrong, you know, just as, just as much as I, as I am right. And that's, you know, that's part of the game, you know, but I try to anticipate what I think is going to happen. And if equities do come off a little bit, I look at the Aussie and what I hope happens here is we, we do pull back a little bit and we reset and we do some sort of bigger inverted head and shoulder pattern. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping happens at the end of the year. What are you thinking, uh, Rolf? Um, do, do you want to take the screen? If you can, you can you take the screen? If you got any charts I, you want to look at? You, I can pass it to him if you want to take it, Rolf. Just let me know. Yeah, sure. Okay, here, let me uh, screen. Let me see. I can stop sharing. And you might have to pass it or change presenter. Here we go. To, well, here you go. Is there a share screen button or? It should, it should, it should come prompt up. you. Do, you. do you see it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, now make sure you have to click the drop down and select which chart. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. yeah, I think. Do you see both screens now or? Yeah, we've got the right screen there. That's good. So you, you, okay, perfect. There. Yeah, so I'm pretty much looking, I guess, at the same things uh, as Blake. I'm, you can see those are all the flag ones. It's only Aussie. Uh, we have some Kiwi pairs, Euro Kiwi. New Zealand, Kiwi, and yeah, they are technically we're still in the uptrend, but as you can see across the board, it has been slowing down, um, especially those types. That's what I'm looking for. Although it's technically against the, the major uptrend, um, it still may be good for a short-term pullback. You see the momentum is slowly rolling over. Um, you can see it's hitting a, it hit a big resistance, the previous top. So yeah, technically we're still in an overall uptrend, but um, since there's no pushback higher, I'm looking for small momentum reversals. We have pretty much all British pound pairs, or many look really, really juicy. You can see British pound Aussie didn't came close to the previous this major turning uh, trend turning point, but fairly close. And you can see the market is um, bottoming out. We have here like a little momentum push. Will be interesting to see how the market reacts to those. Um, if this is like a real breakout, or we're going to see a pullback, but yeah, I guess it's technically all against uh, the long-term uh, trend, but um, Forex is a very mean reverting market. So pullbacks are not, well, it, to pullbacks are not super risky, I would say, depending on um, your time horizon. You don't want to stretch the target um, on a pullback trade extremely long. Uh, but if you can find uh, short pullbacks uh, back into uh, the moving long-term moving averages or back into structures, uh, those are still interesting plays and yeah i think aussie and kiwi this is where pretty much most traders have their can eyes on kiwi up again? can you bring kiwi kiwi dollar up again yeah sure and rolf i can i can i just mention that uh that, that it's great that you brought up those cross rates like the the, the the pound kiwi and the pound aussie those are exact currencies that i i watch on a daily basis because they're diverging away from what the s p is doing and they, they have that inverse relationship. So as as typically as stocks move higher like they are, those pairs should be breaking down, but they're not. And that that is another um, thing that I'm looking at that, that might suggest that we might get a little bit of a re, you know a, a retracement as you're as you're discussing. And I agree with you 100. Yeah, and so, I so, think also sorry. Can I, can I just say, um, just going back into that Kiwi trade because that's a really interesting one. Um, 
you know, for me, when I'm looking at that, like what I like to do is, all right, if, if you're trading on a time frame such as the daily, I, could, I think you're on a two hour there. I'm not sure. I know you're on a daily. You know, how price behaves when, when if we do get the break, um, how price behaves above that level, I think is so important. I like to tend to wait for a daily close above that level. So what would you, when you're teaching your students or you trade yourself, um, when you've got a setup like that, and let's say price does go above that, you know, what are you looking for? How would you, how would you trade the break? we get the break so me personally i would not i would not trade the long side um for me personally it's too far away from from the moving average that i used so it would be technically against my rules it's too overextended um for a, a trend following trade um, when i look for trades into the into the trend or longer term direction i look for um moves that happen much closer to a break and retest for example those are usually when you have early trend following opportunities, which on the lower time frames are not um, too too late in the trend. Uh, but so I would not care. Any, I was gonna say, have you got any statistics around, yeah, you know, when price moves too far away from a, a longer term average, how often it then mean reverts back somewhere close to that long term trend? Right, and this is actually something I, I'm a mostly discretionary trader, but I dabble in um, algorithmic trading as well. And you can see the tendency across when you develop an FX algo, for example, you will see that there's a very, very high um, pullback tendency, um, mean reverting tendency, much higher when you develop um, an algo on stocks or indices, which is generally considered more long term trend following. So pullback trading um, does have a very high um, or has a much higher um, ex positive expectancy than when you do it on, on stocks. I, I don't do it on stocks. I don't have too much experience, but when you just do some basic algo uh, developing, you will see that there's a huge difference in the FX market and and the stock markets when it comes to mean reverting. This is really cool because um, you know, we we, we I think on probably any any normal day we'd we'd probably see 40, 45 percent of our daily flow uh, triggered by some sort of um, expert advisor, some sort of you know systematic strategy. So. Yeah, we, we've seen a huge amount uh, of explosion in the EA space over the last three or four years. And I think technology is evolving and, and it will continue to evolve. And, you know, as a broker, we need to make sure that we're offering, you know, we, we keep up with those trends. Um, but in terms of, you know, EA trading and, and systematic or mechanical trading, um, you know, the ability to take emotion out of the, out of the move is, is so important for people out there who, um, who may be discretionary trade to get frustrated by getting affected by noise that you know they, they end up having loads of small winning trades but then massive losses you know what would your advice to be uh Rolf, to people who are looking um at getting into the ea space into the you know systematic space what would be your 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 your, your early advice into that space right i think the first uh, important thing is that is to understand that if you have emotion problems with emotions in discretionary trading um they won't go away when you do e e eas um there's a lot of emotions attached to developing an ea or not only developing but keeping them relevant because eas need to be readjusted um you need to make sure that it's a very delicate thing when you do when do you turn off an ea when is it not performing as it did in the back test for example so there are many, many ways to screw up uh, when you let emotions get into the game. You turn it off too soon, too late, then you don't trust the EA signal. You interfere with it manually. Um, EA trading is not trading without emotions. It's just a different set of skills that are required, I think. I think it's a very valuable skill in general to have. Um, I learned a lot about discretionary trading when, when I started into EA trading. Um, not only from how do, what are the ways to get into a trade or what are filters, but also how do you develop um, exits? How do you, um, what are the options for exiting trades, for managing positions? Those are very interesting things, whereas in, there are more clear cut, obviously, when you do an algo because you need to have a rule, uh, which I think many discretionary traders can, can benefit from. Pretty much most discretionary traders, they spend like 80 or 90% of their time um, obsessing about the right entry, but then once they're in the trade, they don't really have a way how to handle the trade. What do you do when it goes against you in your favor? What do you do when news are coming up and um, so on and so forth? And during an algo development, you're forced to really address the little those all the different details. You can't just develop 
the entry and just not focus on the exit. So those are um, those are really interesting things and um, good benefits for discretionary traders to also have. So I think it's yeah. a very valuable skill. Cool, Blake. I'm just, I want to touch on. Um, we've got five minutes left um, for a break, um, but I want to touch on um, something that that me as a, a, a guy who uses both technicals, fundamentals is, is something that I'm starting to talk to clients more about. Is 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 the U.S. election? Um, as you know, you, you you live and you breathe it, um, and it's going to get pretty painful, I'd imagine, for you in the next couple of months. And and it's going to get scrappy and it's going to get damn right dirty, I reckon. You know, especially if Trump. Going to like he's going to win it. I think uh, it's going to get it's going to get very heated. It's going to be fascinating watching. Um, but how you know? Do you trade it? How do you trade it? How do you price risk around the election? I mean, what what are you what are you thinking? Well, um, first of all, I I kind of wish I was in either your shoes or Walt's shoes and watching from afar. But you're right. I'm living it, and uh, and, and 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 as you guys know, everybody in the world is watching. Um, you know what's what's happening here in the U.S. and and uh, I, I'm with you. I, I actually think it's going to be really tough for um, Trump to be removed from office. I know he's you know from from the the rest of the world's point of view, he's very divisive, and um, you know even even here in the U.S. Um, you know, we a lot of people here in the U.S. you know see it obviously as well. Um, but the fact of the matter is is uh, when you're in a crisis situation, um, as we are globally with this pandemic uh the, the the odds of him being removed from office in in, in this current situation is going to be very difficult i think and i'm and i'm, I'm trying my damnedest not to be political because obviously i have a lot of stuff to say and i and i don't and i, I try to do this every day on my daily webinars because we do a, an hour free webinar to, to anybody and everybody that wants to listen in um, I, I try to just stay away from politics because I know it's not, um, A, I'm not, a, you know, it's, I'm, I, I really I have no right trying to, get, you know, dish my views on anybody out there. But from a, from a trading point of view, it's important and, and it's important from a, from a risk standpoint. So uh, I think we all have to uh, approach the market as he's going to win. This, this upcoming election, things are going to continue for the next four years. How do we proceed? And I think the path of least resistance right now is equities will go higher, the dollar will go lower, and um, and, and and that's it. And we have to uh, proceed with that that perception. Um, even if he's lagging in the polls, um, I, I, I don't think the polls tell the entire story either. And so, so I think that's just the the route that we have to go at this moment. Now, the question is, if he is not reelected, how does um, the market react to that? And my 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 gut feeling would be an instant 10 to 15 percent, excuse me, correction in equities, which means the dollar would strengthen quite rapidly. But I think you have to be looking to buy on any type of dip. I, I actually think that, that you do it. Uh, JP Morgan just recently put out a piece, actually, I think it was this week, about how Biden would act, a Biden win would actually be positive for stocks. And that's the first piece that I've seen yet <laughs> to say that. But yeah. I, I, do, I do think there would be an initial correction. So. I think the interesting thing from afar is that, um, you know, if it's going to tax at 28%, there's going to be a, an EPS. Um, hit to that, you know. Yes. 10, I, do, I, do, I do think that, but then, then the flip side is, is uh, you, you have to look at um, will the situation and will 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 um, the the China U.S. relationship repair become repaired to a certain extent? And you know, there there's a lot of things that people can say uh, right or wrong, what you know about Trump and his policies, and you know. How, how he acts and you know everything else. The one thing that um, that that I think universally and almost globally people uh, view is that somebody had to go after China and 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 and, um, and kind of you know say hey you guys aren't you know you guys aren't doing things the way that the rest of the world is doing it. So uh, and he did. Whether you uh, agree with his approach or not, you know that's that's your decision, not mine. Um, but the 
thing is, is that relationship has become very strained. So that's the, the flip side of that is, yeah, uh, earnings may take a hit, but maybe the China-U.S. relationship repaired a little bit with a Biden win. So that's why, you know, if we get a dip in equities or we get, we get a, you know, some sort of pullback, I think you have to be looking to buy that dip. Mm. Does that make sense? Well, no, it does. I mean, I, 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 I tend to, my, my, I mean, I'll go with price because I think, you know, when, when Trump came on board and, you know, the world was about to, was supposed to collapse and, you know, we suddenly saw one of the biggest rallies we've ever seen in, in yeah. S&P futures the moment he started speaking and he, and he sounded somewhat presidential. So, you know, I think we can, we can get the, the right outcome, but we may actually get the wrong price. I, I, my gut instinct tells me that, that a Biden win is going to be bad for US assets. I think people are going to want to move them uh, abroad. Uh, and I think the dollar will weaken, despite I think that's where we're going to get the breakdown in correlation between uh, a, a, an equity move and, and the dollar. I think that's where we're going to get it. I think people will want to move out of that um, going forward. But, you know, obviously, I think, you know, if, if Kanye takes it, we could see Kim Kardashian as the um, first lady. I think that would be an interesting uh, dynamic in itself. Um, just before I let you go, gents, um, I don't know if you can do this, Rolf, because, you know, you know, you're looking at charts and your charts tell you what you need to do. But, you know, looking ahead, um, what's what where, you know, what's the number one trade in uh, instinctively, you know, anecdotally, do you do, do you like at the moment? Uh, I'll start with you, Blake. Um, I, I, love precious I love precious metals. I, I think that this massive amount of liquidity that the market is, um, has, has been uh, has seen from every central bank globally. You just go back and look at 2008, 2009, 2010, look at what gold and silver did. This is after the financial crisis. And I think you're gonna see a repeat of that. Now, is does that mean that I'm gonna run out and buy gold right at this moment? No, I think there's a, you know, a lot of indicators are stretched, but what, what, you, what you, you will see, and this is kind of like this, uh, especially technical traders will say, well, you know, you know, relative strength is divergent and oscillators are, you know, closing up and they're a little overbought. And it's like, well, go back and look, you know, just go take a look at the dollar yen when the dollar yen went from, uh, uh, what is it, went from 80 something to 110, you know, when, when that rally, you know, when we got the three pronged, uh, three arrow um, Abe rally. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, believe me, every technical indicator was divergent the whole way up. And we could see the same thing happen with, you know, gold and silver. I think, I think it will, they will be, it will be an explosive move. And you guys may not remember this, or maybe you do, but, uh, you know, there were, there were times in Asian trade back in like, you know, to that, that, that time frame. I, I would, I would literally, step away from my computer, go have dinner, I'd come back and gold's up 40 bucks. And I'm like, whoa, that just happened in Asia. You know, and, yeah. and you're getting, we're possibly gonna get that type of move in, in precious metals. And I know central banks are not as big of buyers now as they were back then. And, you know, but because I think a lot of them are selling some precious metals to fund some of their deficit now, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you, you put that much liquidity in, in the in, into the global markets, people will be yearning for for some of these precious metals. That's just my opinion. Like yeah. I said, that's more of the next. Yeah, I think, I think, I think you're right. If, then, if there's any if there's any um, downturn in the economy from here, you know, the Fed's balance sheet's 32% of GDP. They'll go after the market. They'll they'll make sure that the markets are not the problem. That balance sheet could be at twenty trillion dollars in a few years' time, and you wonder where gold's going to be then. Rolf, any any any? I know it kind of it put you on the spot, and it's not the sort of thing technical analysts do. But you know, is there anything that you really like at the moment? The um, I don't care about names or the long term view. With a daily bias, the most I look into the or try to look in into the futures like one to one and a half daily candles. Um, and that's it. I, I don't even watch news. I, yeah, I'm yeah. very, very, uh, yeah, trying to eliminate all external noises. That's good. That's good. Well, thanks, gents. Uh, thanks, Blake, for getting up at such an early hour, and Rolf, um, you know, for, for for doing this on a Saturday as well. It's been a really interesting chat. Very different from the last one, where, um, you know, we're focused much more on the macro. This is much more sort of the trading uh, lessons, getting into the technicals. 
which is really good. Nice little balance. So, um, you know, you guys giving great insight. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with with Blake or Rolf, um, you know, you can get in touch and you can see their, um, the, the, the presentation will be sent to you. Um, the slides will be sent to you. Sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the, the recording will be sent to you. We'll, there'll be uh, an email afterwards, which is going to have all their contact details, how you can get in touch with them. So if you like what they had to say and you want to touch out, touch base with them, either give them put, go to Twitter, LinkedIn, the usual places, or um, or wait for that uh, email to come through, and you can uh, we'll, we'll show you how you can get in touch with these guys. But uh, we've got one more coming up uh, in 55 minutes, and um, yeah, I just want to say a big thanks to to, to Blake and Rolf for for some great insights. So cheers, gents. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Enjoy. It was fun and enjoy your weekend. Yeah, it was it was great. Well, nice nice meeting you. Yes, nice meeting you too. And thank you, Chris.